painting 10,000 different species of birds has taken her across the country and around the world. She has traveled to Costa Rica, Canada, Ecuador, Japan, South Korea, and the Galapagos looking for birds and adventure. While not making art, Christina works as an environmental educator and bird guide to help promote conservation and get people excited about the natural world. You can see her artwork and follow her adventures at drawing10,000birds.com, which is a wonderful, her art is wonderful. I encourage everyone to check it out. I'm not going to say too much about the program because I'd like her to just get started. And so I'm very happy to present Christina Ball. All right, uh, thank you so much, Dorothy. It's so great to see you. I'm so excited to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Um, you know, during this time, you know, we're all stuck inside, whether it's because of the weather or, you know, the pandemic. So I'm really excited to be able to uh, hopefully take us all out of, uh, out of our homes today and go on a, the best kind of adventure we can have uh, considering the circumstances. So uh, as Dorothy mentioned, I love birds. I love painting birds. And I think it's really important to try to share that, uh, that passion for the natural world uh, with as many people as possible so that we can, you know, care about the environment around us and uh, you know, try to get people, especially young kids, uh, excited about you know, protecting the world that we have. And the Galapagos is an incredible gateway into some of the most incredible wildlife that you can see uh, and observe. You know, you know, David Attenborough has done tons and tons of specials on it for a reason, because everything there is so tame and like nothing else on earth. So without further ado, I'm going to bring up my slideshow here. And just bear with me for a moment. I'm going to share my screen here. And now I'm going to start my show. So I'm going to get up your slideshow. Okay, now hopefully, hopefully you can all see this. And so we'll just jump right into it. So, you know, I'm, a, I'm not exactly the uh, typical demographic of someone who's able to, you know, go to the Galapagos uh, since I'm not independently wealthy. And I was a 25 year old artist at the time. Uh, you know, my dream to see 10,000 birds was realistic in thinking that, you know, there are some birds that are just so uh, out of reach, whether, you know, the Galapagos are not exactly easy to access, that I never imagined that the Galapagos birds would be some uh, of the species that I would get to add to my life list and have the opportunity to intimately observe and then paint. But I was very fortunate in so far as I had a, a dear friend who I work with uh, in the bird world who unfortunately had a terrible, terrible foot injury uh, and then 10 days before she was supposed to go on her trip to the Galapagos, her doctor told her that if she went on the trip, she actually risked losing her foot from the severe infection. And if you get anything out of this talk, besides how cool the Galapagos are, you know, once COVID's over and we can all get back to normal, I hope that you take away the fact that you should always have trip insurance. Because even though it worked out great for me, in so far as this wonderful woman didn't have trip insurance and was generous enough to offer to give me the trip, uh, you should always have trip insurance because uh, if, I, if I hadn't been able to take the trip, then it just would have disappeared and no one could have gone. But fortunately, she was so kind. Let me go on the trip. I got to have this amazing adventure. And I'm always excited to talk to people because uh, I feel like being able to share this with everyone is, a way of, is one way of like paying for the kindness that she showed me. So it was, the Galapagos are just magical, incredible, and let's jump on in and head out there. So the Galapagos themselves are very small islands in the scope of you know, the geographic uh, scale of things. They are owned by Ecuador, which is actually very beneficial because despite their scientific importance, uh, they don't really play a huge role in the political stage because Ecuador is a rather neutral country. So they're about uh, 620 miles west of the coastline of Ecuador. And until the last 100 years, the only way to access them was by boat. Nowadays, you can get there with a quick two hour flight that'll get you the 620 miles uh, from the capital of Ecuador, Quito, which is where I started my, my adventure. There are a couple of airports in the Galapagos. Uh, one of them is uh, the on the small island of Baltra and hopefully you can see on the map, it's the middle island right there. So when you leave Ecuador, you leave Quito, you land in the middle of the Galapagos and then most trips uh, tend to move around. Uh, we moved in a clockwise motion starting going first uh, northward to the island of Genovesa uh, and then moving counterclockwise so we could explore all of the islands and see as much of the wildlife as possible ending on San Cristobal in the far uh, east there, and then heading back to Baltra to take off. Um, you know, historically, because most of the, because most, uh, throughout time, most people who visited the island can only get there by boat, 
the islands were given the nickname Las Islas Encantadas uh, because of the strong currents surrounding the island, as well as the very thick and heavy fog that the, that the um, sailors and people who visited the island give the nickname the Garua Mists. Uh, it would often seem as though the islands weren't even there. You know, the currents were so strong and the islands would just disappear in the fog. Uh, sailors and other whalers and pirates who took advantage of the islands uh, believed that they would just occasionally disappear. And so they got this nickname, these enchanted islands, these bewitched islands. So aside from their incredible uh, intrigue, just because of all the wildlife uh, and then the scientific value they have, they're also magical insofar as, according to legend, they just disappear. Uh, and you can see from some of these pictures I have that the islands themselves, they're volcanic islands, they're very, very young. And the, you can see immediately when you get there, you know, the the coastlines are rocky, jagged, and most of the islands are actually cooling volcanic rock. Uh, these are some of the youngest islands uh, in the world, just like speaking um, from geographic terms, they're less than a million years old. So like the youngest islands, uh, which in geographic terms is basically just a sneeze. And we'll get into that a little bit more later, but that, uh, that youthfulness of the islands, as well as its uh, very isolated location are some of the key components that allow the ecosystem to exist the way it does. So, you know, most people have heard of the Galapagos in one way or another, uh, largely because of the idea of evolution and the idea of natural selection. So Charles Darwin uh, actually was one of the first people to visit the Galapagos and, uh, and really document his findings there. Uh, he, uh, he embarked on a voyage that landed him in the Galapagos in 1835 on the HMS Beagle. And from there, you know, it's all history. He noticed that the different islands uh, had these finches that were superficially very similar in appearance. However, they all had slightly different variations on their beak size, food preference, and the habitat that they preferred. And he was able to observe these finches as well as other species that slightly different amongst the islands, such as the tortoises and the mockingbirds. And by watching them, he realized that the unique uh, conditions of the islands had allowed these finches to adapt specifically uh, to their specific island and evolve to fill the ecological niches available to them. So his work on the origin of species is based on his uh, studies of the Galapagos uh, wildlife. And you know that is now you know, the standard by which we understand how speciation occurs now, what's really interesting is that Darwin's work is not finished. You know, all these years later, they are still studying these finches in the Galapagos and they are still finding new species. There are now currently 18 different species of Galapagos finches on the islands. With who knows how many more still to come as they're able to use more modern methods of, of study such as DNA sequencing and other more technical lab work that Darwin obviously didn't have back in the 1800s. Um, so the climate, of the Galapagos is one of the key factors that makes it such a dynamic uh, ecosystem. So its location in the Pacific Ocean um, gives it this very unique composition of currents that surround it. So coming in, it's a three current convergent area. And so coming in from the east, we have an El Nino, which means that every year from January through April, or April, the Galapagos has very hot, humid, rainy, climates. It's not really recommended to go visit then unless you want to get really, really wet and bitten up by a lot, a lot, a lot of mosquitoes. But during that time, the island is able to get all of the rain and nutrients it needs because then during the, uh, from June to November, the Humboldt current comes in from the south, bringing all the nutrient rich and very, very cold water uh, from Antarctica. And this creates a uh, dry and cool climate. Um, and then on the other hand, we have coming in from the east, we have the Cromwell current, which brings in all these nutrients from, the other, from sort of like a, the desert of nutrients that is the Pacific Ocean. And the Cromwell currents uh, creates this really cold but nutrient rich area around the west side of the Galapagos, which brings with it a lot of sea creatures such as whales and dolphins that take advantage of that rich um, nutrient ecosystem. And that further allows other wildlife and other organisms to take advantage of that underwater current. So all of these different uh, all these different currents together create an environment that uh, has all these disparities throughout the year, but allows so many different organisms to thrive in this environment. All right. So geographically, geologically speaking, like I mentioned earlier, the Galapagos are very, very young. 0.7 million years is nothing. 
uh, the oldest islands are only about 4 million years old, if that, because they're volcanic uh, and there are actually active volcanoes on the island. This is an active volcano area. Fortunately, none went off when I was there. Uh, the islands themselves are actually still growing and forming. And uh, I have some pictures here. If you notice the one in the middle on the top row, uh, that loopy spirally type gray rock is actually cool, is actually lava that has just recently cooled into a rock, into a lava formation called Hui Hui, uh, which in Hawaiian is, uh, is describing the wavy shapes in the lava. And on the furthermost right side of the, of the top row, you see really pointed jagged rocks, and that is cooling lava called a'a, which in Hawaiian translates to hurt. And that is because that lava has cooled so quickly that the rocks are really pointy and spiky. And I actually had the very unfortunate experience of sitting on one of those to try to take a picture of an iguana. And I got up so fast that I heard this unbelievable rip through uh, my shorts that I was wearing. And I got up to very shamefully realize that my shorts had just been ripped completely open by the a'a. Uh -uh, and I had to walk off the island very shamefacedly uh, with my ripped shorts. And unfortunately, because it was the Galapagos, I could not go buy more shorts. So I tried to uh, sew them with my uh, paracord, which was neon blue. So I had the best outfit on the Galapagos uh, that day. Very memorable. So the uh, picture I have on the top left row, that is a, a rock called Kicker Rock. And I put it in this uh, slide here because that is actually a thick, thick piece of granite. And the rest of the island's volcanic activity has actually caused the surrounding lava to fall off that rock, uh, essentially leaving it, leaving the thick granite inside as the only remaining visible a piece of the island, piece of that particular um, uh, island protruding out of the ocean that you can see. So all around the island, you can see evidence of the volcanic activity occurring and how that volcanic activity and the, the dynamic aspect of this landscape is still changing uh, the island itself. Uh, and because the Galapagos are so young, the actual, um, the actual ground around you, the, the landscape, uh, really does not look like the lush jungle or beach scene you might expect uh, of an island. Most of the islands, especially the youngest ones, which are uh, on the west side of the islands, so Fernandina and Isabella, those are the two youngest islands. They're 0.7 million years old. Uh, they are still in the stages of primary colonization. So most of the organisms there, that in terms of plants, are algaes, uh, very algaes, mosses, very low ground cover. And then as you can see in the bottom right corner, the lava cacti, are uh, one of the earliest, more significant plants you can see on the islands as they start to undergo succession. Uh, the main sources of vegetation on the island are very low grasses, shrubs. And you can see it when you get to the left side of the bottom row, uh, some of the older islands do have more evidence of vegetation. And then in areas where people have started farming, uh, they do have some imported trees, which I can tell you look very out of place in an environment that otherwise looks more like a moonscape uh, than anything else. Uh, so because the wildlife is such a significant aspect of how most people know about the Galapagos, I think it's very interesting to just take a moment to also consider the reality that the Galapagos are not only home to animals. Uh, even though the national park of the Galapagos is 95% of the islands, the Galapagos have a population of 40,000 people and growing. That number was last recorded. The most recent data was uh, 2014. That number was 40,000. And as tourism continues to boom on the islands, uh, you know, more people in an attempt to find good jobs actually come to the islands uh, to become guides or work with the tourism industry. The, uh, the guides in the Galapagos are actually strictly, strictly vetted. You have to know a lot to have this job and there are very strict guidelines that have to be followed as both a guide and as a visitor to the islands to ensure that the, uh, the integrity of the, of the wild park is maintained. So when I got there off the plane, before we can even get off the plane, uh, they fumigated everything in the plane so that any or organisms that were foreign would not be brought onto the island. Uh, we had to prove that we had to show everyone our luggage to make sure that there were no vegetables or foods or foreign substances that could perhaps bring, uh, you know, invaders to the island. And we even had to walk on AstroTurf as we walked off the airplane to the little um, entry booth. Uh, to make sure that any foreign dirt or organisms on our shoes were, were wiped off. So they take it very, very seriously. Uh, and as I'll mention a little, in a little bit, that is because 
you know, the islands are so safe and protected because they are so far from the mainland, but the advent of people uh, on the mainland has brought the only, the, the biggest disruptors to the careful, fragile ecosystem in the form of invasive plants and animals. So they definitely take it seriously. They don't let you in unless you prove that you are not going to harm the environment and they don't let you out without proving that you know, you're not taking anything out with you. Um, unfortunately, in terms of the, uh, the human population on the island, there's a very fragile balance between the people who actually live there and the conservation and scientific efforts that uh, you know, the island is, that the Galapagos are constantly undertaking. Uh, the island is actually very impoverished. The residents there live in very third world conditions you know, with the exceptions being those who are able to really take advantage of the tourist industry or maybe the guides. And so because of this, there's often friction between the tourists, uh, the, uh, well, not necessarily the tourists, but the, you know, the, the dynamic of tourism creates this friction between uh, the people who want to try to, you know, increase their standard of living with the need to continue that conservation. And one of the interesting things I noticed right away was that the the fee to actually get into the national park, which like I said, is 95% of the island is $100 USD, which is an obscene amount of money to people who live here. So many of them can't even get into the park uh, without special uh, exemptions, which, you know, if you think about that, you know, it's a very unfair that only, you know, tourists can come in and enjoy most of the land. And then, you know, it's a, it's a big problem. And then fishing, of, there was a big problem in the 1990s with fishing where there was a huge boom in, in sea cucumber uh, demand and the fishermen wanted to take that opportunity to make that money, but they almost wiped out the sea cucumbers. So, in the end, the conservationists won, and it has caused a lot of uh, ill will between the fishermen and conservationists. So, very fragile balance there. Um, and the bottom left hand corner, I have a picture of uh, the Charles Darwin Scientific Station, which was established uh, in 1959 in honor of Charles Darwin. They've done much, they have done a lot of research there on uh, restoring some of the populations of animals that have been damaged by invasives. Um, the picture on the right is a picture of Puerta Ayora, which is one of the main ports uh, where people can go to shops, um, where they can actually see what uh, the homes like where people live. Uh, and the top picture, I actually have this great little uh, Galapagos tradition, which is the first post office and only post office box on the island. Uh, back in 1807, the first documented inhabitant of the island, Patrick Watkins, established this post office box on the island of Floriana. And when whalers or pirates or sailors would come by, they would pick up, you know, they would leave mail and pick up mail. And so mail was transported by travelers going back and forth. And, you know, you never know when you're gonna get your letter, but one nice thing about this post office box is it's still here and visitors to the Galapagos can actually leave, you know, a postcard or a letter. And then other visitors who come, you know, I, I flipped through all the letters that were available looking for one that I could hand deliver. And I found one of someone who lives in Connecticut and I, when I returned home from the Galapagos, hand delivered that letter uh, from the post office box. So it really does work, even though it takes quite a while to actually get your mail. But considering 200,000 visitors plus come to the Galapagos every year, you know, the odds are eventually you will get your letter. Though sadly, I never got mine. Who knows? All right, so invasive species, like I said, I'm just going to talk a little bit more about this because they're one of the biggest uh, sources of friction between the you know, the ability to balance tourism, balance science, balance conservation. Uh, some of the biggest threats to many of the species in the Galapagos actually are invasive species. Uh, this is a picture here of a goat skeleton. Uh, the goat situation is actually one of the most successful uh, eradication uh, initiatives of the, of the Galapagos conservation projects. They were able to eliminate all the goats from many of the islands, which has allowed a lot of the vegetation to return uh, there are still, however, a lot of problem animals like cats, dogs, and particularly rats. Rats are a big one because rats destroy many, many nests and many, many young, uh, many, many of the animals on the islands. So until, these, until they're able to get rid of all the rats and some of the other problem animals, uh, a lot, of, a lot of, of the organisms that would otherwise be perfectly safe in these isolated islands are very much in danger. All right, so on to my favorite part. As a wildlife artist, obviously the wildlife was the most exciting thing for me uh, and for many of the people who come here because there's no place on earth like this. And there are so many animals here that, you know, they're so tame. Even when the very first person to discover the Galapagos and document it in 1535, the Bishop of Panama came to the Galapagos, he described the just unbelievable tameness of the animals. And 
you know, 1535, you know, almost 500 years later, uh, that situation has not changed. And it's partly because of the strict rules that the national park has in terms of, you know, you can't go near the animals. You cannot touch the animals. If they're in the path, you can step over the animals, but you know, they're very strict about making sure the animals get to continue to exist uh, in non in habitats that are not touched by people. And because of this, the Galapagos are able to continue to have some of the highest rates of endemic species in anywhere in the world, meaning that there are animals here that you cannot find anywhere else that have been able to evolve here uh, in these very unique conditions um, without interruption from any outside influences before people came. So uh, statistically speaking, 80% uh, of the birds are endemic, 97% uh, of the reptiles and mammals are endemic, and 30% of the plants are endemic. And if you think about it, that is a lot of wildlife that you can only see here into the Galapagos. And as someone who wants to see every bird in the world, I was out of my mind with joy realizing that I was going to get to see so many birds that I otherwise would never have been able to see. So let's, so let's jump into the animals. You know, one of the iconic uh, Galapagos species is the sea lion. The Galapagos sea lion, though very similar to the sea lions you might see in California, or along the Pacific coast uh, are endemic. They are a specific species that has evolved uh, its own DNA in the Galapagos. Uh, the, Gal the Galapagos sea lions, you know, I laugh as I talk about them because they're just so wonderfully adorable. They're these, one of the first things I saw when I started, when I got on the island was this big lump of a seal just standing in the path. And, you know, they'd scared us to death saying, you know, don't touch the animals, don't go near the animals. But there was no way to get around the seal because it was so huge without just stepping over this huge lump. It was like, it was like a cat, only it was a seal. And it didn't even blink as, you know, a, our whole group of 15 just all stepped on over it. Uh, you know, they, they're great because on every single island you can see them, you know, sunning on the beaches or uh, swimming, in, swimming offshore. And one of the cool things about them uh, is that we actually got to swim with them when we went snorkeling. I'm going to show you some cool things, a cool video I took um, in a moment, but I just want to also touch on the other uh, main mammal that you can see on the island, which is the northern fur seal. Uh, it's very, very similar to the Galapagos sea lion. It is also endemic. Uh, the only difference is that the uh, fur seal has a much, much heavier coat. And so, you know, as, as whalers, pirates, and early sailors were visiting the islands, uh, they actually would often kill them for their coats. So they were very, very endangered until conservation efforts were able to slowly bring them back. Um, you can see here these little pups are all, they're just also unbelievably adorable. And the mammals in the Galapagos, uh, unlike most places where there's many, many mammals, there are very, very few mammals in the Galapagos because of the large distance between the mainland and uh, you know, the islands. The only things that could get to the islands are anything that could fly, swim, or hitch a ride. So because that's very difficult for large mammals, uh, unless they are a whale, a dolphin, or a sea lion, there are no other big mammals on the island. The only other animals, the only other mammals really are bats and then the rats, which we don't really want there. Uh, so the, the sea lions, the, they're very communal. They stay in these huge groups, uh, sleep together all day. It's truly adorable. Um, and then underwater, you know, these big lubbering blobs suddenly become these incredibly graceful amazing swimmer. So let me see if I can get, get my video to play here. Oops. So I'm not a videographer, so this is not the best video, but this seal was so close to me underwater, but I could just hold up my underwater camera and this happened. They are absolutely fearless and are so acclimated to people that I actually have a friend who was wearing a shiny uh, a shiny little camera strap and it came up and gently nibbled on her arm because they like they are attracted to shiny things and it just wanted to play like they just want to play and you can feel that energy and so you know there was this great this great moment of just being flipping over dancing with the seals underwater I of course was unbelievably ungraceful and the seal just nose booped me um and I just about keeled over I was so unbelievably happy I mean look at that sweet little face Oops. All right, so underwater is an entirely other world. And you know, I'm a bird person, fish are one of the last things I know, but the fish in the Galapagos were so distinct that even I could identify them. 
Um, one of the great things about going to the Galapagos is that it's a two-part adventure. There's the land component. And then if you feel so inclined, you can grab a wetsuit and a snorkel and just see an entire new world under the water. And it is an entirely different world. It was like nothing I'd ever experienced. It felt like being in some kind of science fiction movie where there's all these different creatures with all these different colors and, and textures. And I was totally out of my element. Uh, and as you can see here, there's quite an array of, of different creatures. There was fish, there were these fishes with big heads, there were these puffer fish that would go every time you got close to them. There were even some endemics underwater. There's that little triple fish, Blenny, and then that I was even an octopus I swam over. That was really cool. And in the middle here, you can see this Galapagos sea cucumber. And I included uh, this little critter because as I mentioned, uh, the friction between this, the fishermen and the conservationists uh, have been very much in part to this little critter here, uh, which looks rather unassuming, uh, but was a huge source of contention. Uh, there weren't, they had really, really low numbers after all the fishing problems, but fortunately uh, they are coming back and I was able to see one. Oof. So, I mean, from an artist's perspective, the color under the water was nothing like I imagined. I mean, there was just color, all kinds of color in this beautiful blue world. And you're just surrounded by these huge walls of fish. And I just had this moment of feeling like I was totally helpless and could just fall off the universe into this wall of endless fish. And I took this video to just try to show how they just never seemed to end and you were just completely and utterly surrounded by fish. Everywhere I went, more fish, more fish, more fish. Just me and the fish. Me and the sound of my breath and the sound of them moving and the fish. All right, so aside from the fish, we have a, I'm gonna cover invertebrates a little quickly. Um, it's hard to really think about any other invertebrate besides the Sally Lightfoot crab because it is the most spectacular crab I have ever seen. It steals the show. They are up to 20 centimeters long, so they're huge. Uh, they, and they really are these beautiful colors. Like we talk about, you know, colors underwater. This red, yellow, and blue is yet another artist's dream. And this is an adult Sally Lightfoot crab that has these colors. Um, and the reason they have that name is uh, they seem to be walking on water as they scuttle from rock to rock. You can sort of see in this picture uh, that kind of effect of looking like it is on the water. And they were on every island and they were so cool to see all the time. Uh, the cool thing about invertebrates in the Galapagos is that because they are not, you know, those iconic, eye-catching, charismatic megafauna, there are still thousands and thousands of invertebrates that have yet to be even discovered on these islands. So, you know, scientists are constantly looking for new organisms and this place, who knows how many it has. These are just a couple other examples of some that were obviously easy for me to see and identify. That cute little endemic Galapagos hermit crab, these fabulous starfish, which were everywhere and just were such camera hands, as you can see here, and then these adorable little green urchins. And then uh, I just wanted to point out that their Sally Lightfoot crab also comes in these colors, like the fun doesn't end. You also have this fantastic um, color palette here. Um, so in terms of reptiles, uh, there are a rather large number of endemics in this um, animal group. Uh, the first one I bumped into was the Galapagos green turtle, which is a very large underwater creature. And if you're not expecting it and it suddenly rises up under you, it is shocking, but it is so slow and methodical. And when I looked into its big brown eye and you could see all the moss on its wrinkly body, I felt like I was looking at something that had been alive and knew so much more wisdom than I did. And just the way they just move so slowly and deliberately through the water. Um, unfortunately, the Galapagos sea turtles are one of the organisms that was very negatively affected by uh, the introduction of rats to the island because they bury their eggs in sand, uh, the eggs unfortunately are easy, easy targets for the rats. And only about 1,000 of the turtles makes it to maturity anyway. And so they were not doing well. Fortunately, uh, with a lot of the uh, elimination of rats in many parts of the island, they are you know, slowly coming back, but uh, it's, a, it's an organism that despite you know, that big shell that makes it seem so tough and in, in impregnable, they, they, do, they did have that very serious uh, weakness all right, so the Galapagos tortoise. This is one that, uh, you know, people know about the finches. Uh, the tortoise is another one that a lot of people know about. It was one of the animals that 
um, that Darwin looked at when he was coming up with his ideas of natural selection. Uh, so the Galapagos tortoise is actually the animal that gives the Galapagos its name. Uh, in 1574, Abraham Ostelier uh, dubbed the islands the Galapagos after uh, the turtles. Galapagos in Spanish means saddle, which is a, a kind of a description that fits the, the shape of the shells of these tortoises. So Galapagos means saddle, which is, and is named for the Galapagos turtles with their saddle backs. Now each of the islands has a different tortoise uh, and you can actually tell them apart based on the shape of their shell, which is either a saddle shape or a dome shape. And scientists who really know the turtles can actually pinpoint exactly which item they come from based on the shape of their shell. So these here are some uh, of the dome tortoises. Uh, there was one very famous tortoise named Lonesome George who lived on the island of Pinta. And unfortunately, he was the very last of his race of Pinta tortoises. And one of the reasons for this is that the island of Pinta was one of the first islands that sailors would encounter as they were uh, going into the Galapagos. And uh, unfortunately, it was also the last, uh, last island they would embark, could embark upon before leaving the archipelago. And even though they, again, looked so impregnable with that huge shell, Galapagos tortoises are actually really, uh, how should I put this? They're quite the delicacy if you are a sailor or a pirate or a whaler, you know, on a ship back in the 15, 1600s and you have no other source of food. You know, you, they were so tame, you could just walk up, pick up the tortoises because they didn't need a lot of food and water. Uh, sailors would put them in the holds of their ships and uh, keep them around as a source of food and water. So the Galapagos tortoise was severely, uh, was a severely, um, uh, sorry, it was, it was so severely uh, used for food that uh, they were very much in need of a recovery program. Fortunately, the Darwin Center was very good and still continues to work to improve their numbers. But poor Lonesome George, the last Pinta tortoise, they were never able to find uh, a mate for him. And in 2012, Lonesome George died, the last of his kind, but he has become an incredible symbol of conservation uh, and then the efforts required to continue to restore this group of animals. Okay, so marine iguanas, another one of my favorite reptiles from the, from the islands. Uh, they are wild. They are a sea going reptile. They swim, they go underwater to eat this algae. And then the best part is because they're eating underwater when they come out on land, they have to get rid of all that salt that they ingested. So, you know, they, they're sunning themselves on the rocks, bunches and bunches of these iguanas. And suddenly you just suddenly he, see it sneeze, a salt snot sneeze, which is just wild. And, you know, here's a picture of them swimming, which is hard to believe this reptile just gets in the water and swims. Um, but because they are reptiles, they do have to, uh, sorry, go in and out of the water all day uh, in order to eat. You know, they have to come back on land and warm themselves up and then go back into the water, which is really cold to get their food. So you see the, the uh, marine iguanas coming in and out, sneezing their, their salt snot sneezes and then going back into the water later, really wild. And then here's a picture of a whole group of them sunning themselves. And then many of them will, you know, just spontaneously sneeze and it's hysterical. All right, now we're on to my favorite part, which is the birds, you know, no talk about the Galapagos is complete without the magic of the blue-footed booby, one of the dorkiest birds uh, in all existence. Uh, so, you know, they got those incredible blue feet, which, you know, actually, if you need a good flirting technique, apparently in the world of, of birds, the, the, the bluer your feet, uh, the more likely you are to get a date. So the blue-footed boobies have this incredible dance where they kick those, those blue feet high in the air and they uh, point their heads up and whistle. And then they do this other cool thing called sky pointing, which is where they point their wings out and they stick their heads straight up at the sky while shut and they show off those feet. So the whole thing is this, I guess it's a, uh, you know, what the, what the women blue footed boobies want and um, it works. It's so unbelievably dorky. You know, when I go to birder prom, which is this great birding event, uh, that's what I'm going to be rocking uh, on the dance floor once we're allowed to socialize again after the pandemic. So, uh, here they, I have a picture on the left that's about to go into a sky point. You can see its beak pointing up and there it is showing off those fabulous blue feet. And there it is in a complete sky point, so majestic. And the other cool thing about boobies is even though they are unbelievably dorky on land, uh, they're actually quite graceful in the flight. And here's a picture of three boobies uh, simultaneously diving, like synchronized diving, it's called plunge diving, where they'll actually, as they're about to hit the water, pull their wings in and become these great torpedoes, break the water, get their fish, and actually swim underwater 
uh, with their wings. They're really cool. Here's a quick little video I have of a uh, chick, which you can tell also looks unbelievably majestic, begging. I was so uh, entranced by all the wildlife that I didn't take as many videos as I wanted to. Come on. But here's one I did remember to take. Make this little dork in there. Look at the way it walks. Such grace, such majesty. Talk about rough puberty, that little fluff ball. Yep, yep, yep. Bag, 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 bag. Uh, so there are three species of boobies that live in the Galapagos. All of three species are very difficult to see uh, in other habitats along the coast, but in the Galapagos, you can practically step on them. This is the second, the Nazca booby, which you can see is very different uh, in appearance. You've got that mask, doesn't really have very spectacular feet, uh, but it's still a very handsome booby. And you know, if you watch them fishing offshore, while well, this one also plunge, dive, plunge dives like the blue one, uh, the three different boobies actually uh, fish in different uh, sections of the ocean. So you can sort of see, uh, you know, if it's closer inland, that's a blue footed. The Nazcas, they do their fishing uh, further out uh, from, the, from the cliffs. And then the third booby, the red footed booby, which has those glorious, amazing feet, that one will actually fish way, way, way out past the islands. Uh, so that's actually hard to observe that particular behavior. So the, the red-footed booby is the, the smallest of the three boobies, and it comes in two flavors, uh, white and brown, and it has the most unbelievable feet. Its dance is not, I wasn't able to see its dance the same way I could see the blue-footed booby dance, but I had this great evening where the sun was just shining through those red feet, and boy, like what a spectacular creature. And then, you know, all three of the boobies, uh, their babies, when, you're that, when you look that good, you know, your babies just have to come out <laughs> looking like this, right? these adorable little Muppets just screaming for food all day, like, ah, oh, parenthood, right there. So uh, the thing about the Galapagos Islands is that uh, because so many of the species are endemic, uh, this actually puts them in a very precarious position, particularly aside from the invasive species that they have to worry about, uh, there are other factors such as climate change and global warming that are you know, putting a lot of pressure on these animals that only exist here in the Galapagos. This lava gull is a great example of a species like this. There are no more than 500 pairs and they only live on these islands. Uh, and they have been heavily preyed upon by rats, you know, their egg, with their eggs. And the other problem is that a lot of their nest sites uh, have problems with rising sea levels and other kinds of, you know, weather effects. So, you know, this is a bird that I was very conscious of, sorry, I was very, um, aware when I was looking at it that, you know, this could be well, well be a bird that could be extinct within my lifetime, uh, you know, if, if steps weren't taken to ensure its, its ability to continue to breed and, and live in these islands. Uh, there's another very cool gull in the Galapagos I just wanted to highlight because I thought it was one of the coolest gulls ever. This is a swallowtail gull, and it is the only gull that hunts at night, which is awesome. Those little red rings around its eyes, they might actually be able to help it see better in the dark. And so it goes out at night and hunts squid. And the coolest thing about the Galapagos uh, by far was just how you can see so many intimate moments of all of these animals. And so these, these swallowtail gulls here, I was maybe like five feet from me and I could watch them preening and they were just so beautiful. And yeah, I don't think there's any place like this on earth where you can see you know, the natural behaviors of these animals playing out uh, so, so just so uh, honestly. And it's a really humbling thing to you know, to be part of that and realize that all this is going on thousands and thousands of miles from me every day. And for a brief moment, you know, I get to, I get to be part of it too. Um, all right, so continuing on with the birds now that I've waxed philosophical. Uh, this bird here is one of my favorites. It's the frigate birds. Oh, you can see them down in Florida sometimes, like in the Keys, but here they were all over. And they are like the epitome of what can be thought of as sea pirates because they don't have the ability to secrete the same kind of waterproofing a fluid that other water birds can, they cannot plunge dive to get fish. So instead, they go and steal it from other birds. Uh, this is called kleptoparasitism. And uh, many of the birds in the Galapagos, uh, like that swallowtail gull and another I'm about to show you, are frequent uh, targets of, of this piracy. And it's a really cool thing to watch these birds just air like, very, very dynamically, all these different uh, aerial maneuvers. They really are like man of war planes. They all these loop-de-loops and quick flips to try to grab that fish out of their targets, out of their targets' talons. Uh, and then, you know, if you needed some more flirting ideas, if the blue feet don't do it for you, 
uh, the, uh, the magnificent frigate bird might suggest an inflatable red throat pouch, which, uh, you know, it definitely is a turn on to the lady frigate birds during mating season. And then that little Muppet thing is, is its chick. Uh, the frigate birds have to guard their nest at all times because uh, aside from the dangers of predation on the chicks, uh, frigate birds uh, aren't really even nice to each other. The males will go out and steal sticks from another frigate bird's nest if no one's watching uh, to add to their own nest. And here's this great little series of, again, parenthood at its finest where the, the female frigate bird is, is feeding some regurgitated fish that it stole. Uh, and the uh, little Muppet is uh, eating it right out of the pouch in the mouth. And then uh, the male frigate bird is such a great, such a great guy that he then decides he's gonna have a little uh, bit of the food too. So there's, a, there's no honor among pirate thieves here. Quite a mess. Here's a picture of uh, the frigate bird going after a swallowtail gull, the poor thing. And then here's a picture of a magnificent frigate bird and uh, ruining all the hard work of this mother bird, blue-footed booby. So like I said, you get to see these really intimate, you know, unimpeded moments of wildlife interaction out here. And some of it is quite intense, very much a David Attenborough. Uh, environment. Uh, and like I've said that, you know, even though they have all that great uh, behavior and all that piracy going on in flight, they really are, they really do look like, like fighter jets. And they're really, really cool to watch. This I took while I was laying on the deck of the boat and the frigate bird was just flying overhead. Uh, this here is the red-billed tropic bird uh, named after uh, Phaeton from the Greek mythology. This is another, pr uh, this is another target of the frigate birds. Uh, and it is built to escape those uh, sea pirates. So, you know, sort of harkening back to that myth of Phaeton, as the red-billed tropic bird is able to very carefully navigate this, the environment between, you know, the top edge of the, uh, of the sky where the frigate birds can easily bombard it and the dangerous, you know, spray of the ocean where it can easily lose its fish. Uh, the frigate bird has to navigate that space sort of like Phaeton had to navigate uh, the hot sun and then, uh, you know, getting nailed in the water as he drove the chariot of the sun and very much like the, uh, very much like the danger that Phaeton had to face if the tropic bird uh, miscalculates in its trajectory and its flight, uh, the frigate bird will take it down. Uh, and you know, like Phaeton, you know, he went too close to the sun, his chariot burned. Uh, if the tropic bird gets too far out of its uh, safe, safe trajectory, the, the frigate bird will steal that fish and take it down. That, oh, and that in the bottom right left there, that's a juvenile frigate bird and what an adorable face that is. Whoops, all right, so I've got a couple more birds to show you. This here is uh, one I love to look at because it is a perfect example of evolution uh, in these islands. This flightless cormorant is a bird that has directly changed to adapt to its island home. We have cormorants near where we live. I see them at Sheldrake all the time, but you'll notice that the wings on this flightless cormorant are useless. They don't need to fly anymore. They're safe on their islands. So. They now only swim, and these vestigial wings are just um, a remnant of the, of the wings they used to have before they uh, colonized the Galapagos Islands. You know, they, this, is a little, this is a little flightless cormorant uh, leaping out of the water after a successful swim. You see its wings are quite tiny and useless. Uh, so the Galapagos Shearwater uh, was a really cool moment in my Galapagos trip. We got to see these birds um, from the back of the boat and one evening. And the cool thing about these shearwaters is that they live their entire lives at sea. Uh, so even though they have the opportunity to go anywhere uh, across the Pacific, they stay around the Galapagos and therefore are endemic to the, to the islands. And uh, you know, there's still so much science to be done and so much discoveries to be made. And one mystery that's out there in the Galapagos is no one knows where these Galapagos, where these Galapagos shearwaters go into roost uh, when they roost on land and where they go to breed. Uh, so one thing that was very cool when I was in the Galapagos, there was one evening where we actually saw these birds take off from the water in such a way that when we watched their trajectory, our guide actually realized that they were going in a direction that he'd never noticed before and uh, could be a direction that they were going to roost, which would help them figure out where these birds actually go to breed, where they go to roost. Uh, and so it was just a really cool thing to be part of what could be uh, another big Galapagos discovery. And then... Um, my absolute favorite bird was the penguin. I know it's cliche, but come on, penguins are great. And this penguin is particularly special because it is the penguin found um, most for the furthest north of any penguin in the world. It's the only penguin found in the Northern Hemisphere. It was very bizarre to see a penguin uh, in a place owned by Ecuador, which I think of as generally a very hot, warm place, not like the frigid cold of Antarctica. Uh, but these penguins, they love it here. 
And until uh, rats came in and started to eat all the eggs from their nests, they had it great. Um, the other big problem with these penguins is that climate change is causing sea levels to rise and they make their nests in little crevices in rocks. And as those rocks are submerged, they're losing nesting spaces. So a lot of creative scientists are actually creating little lava uh, nests uh, out of cool lava and bits to try to simulate the, the caves that they like. And it's actually working to help these Galapagos penguins have alternative nesting sites. Um, pelicans, uh, you know, they're a bird we have, uh, where, where we live in the United States, we actually had one up in Connecticut a few weeks ago, very lost, felt bad for it. Uh, but here the pelicans have uh, evolved to the point where they are now a separate subspecies. And they actually have this kind of interesting relationship with another bird that lives in the Galapagos, the brown knotty. Uh, the knotties will have learned to sit on the pelicans heads, waiting for the pelicans to, you know, get a fish. And then as soon as it has that fish, the knotties will swoop in and try to get a bite out of its mouth. Uh, so not so great for the pelican, but an interesting example of how, uh, how species have you know, evolved their own ways of communicating and living together in these isolated islands. And then I, I wanted to show you how there are other birds that you might recognize in the Galapagos. Uh, for instance, the great blue heron, we have plenty at Sheldrake, plenty in ponds, great egrets, we see those all the time during the summer, yellow crowned night heron. Uh, somehow these birds managed to make it from North America, South America, and they are now residents of the Galapagos as well. And as you know, as time passes, they may one day have their own subspecies or become their own species as they uh, evolve to fill the specific uh, niches caused by the Galapagos. There is one heron in the Galapagos, the, the lava heron, which is endemic. And you can see that it's, it's a gray coloration was evolved to help, uh, help it blend into the mangroves around the uh, more aquatic islands and then the, the lava cliffs uh, of, of many of the spaces where there's lava cooling. And then uh, I want to show you one more little bird uh, that is actually the same species as one that we have here in the East Coast that will be arriving this April, the adorable yellow warbler. Uh, the one on the bottom left is the one that we see around us. There are plenty of them at Sheldrake. Uh, but then this Galapagos yellow warbler, thousands and thousands of miles away, uh, is the exact same species, but it has evolved this subspecies, which you can see has this very different coloration, that red crest, that gray hood. But it was amazing to hear us, the song coming out of its mouth was still the same song as this bird that sings thousands of miles away in New York. I mean, evolution is just truly amazing. Oops. All right, the Galapagos uh, in general are great for a lot of these birds because they don't have a ton of predators. However, there are uh, two carnivorous raptors that live in the Galapagos. This Galapagos hawk is one of them and they play an important role uh, in filling that carnivorous niche. Uh, they eat lots of small birds, occasionally, you know, the rats, snakes, lizards, and they're also, uh, they also clean up some of the dead stuff, so they're helpful in that way. You can see here it, car it carrying off this little crab that it found on the beach that had already died, scavenging. And then you have the diurnal equivalent of the carnivore. There is an owl that lives on the Galapagos, the short-eared owl, uh, which is a subspecies of an owl that we have here. We can see it in New York, uh, up in Ulster County, but this short-eared owl, uh, this subspecies, has sort of evolved this uh, ability to carefully hide in rock crevices uh, to try to catch that it uh, is able to sort of fly out and catch the the shear waters and the storm petrels like the ones I showed earlier that fly near the cliffs. So it has evolved its own specific hunting styles uh, that may one day continue to help it become its own species. Now the last couple of birds I have are the ones that uh, you know are, make the Galapagos famous in terms of evolution. Uh, these here are the mockingbirds that are some of the species Charles Darwin studied. And as you might be able to see from the pictures, while they look superficially similar, there are slight, uh, there are slight physical variations in beak size and some of the mass around their faces and an overall coloration that helped Darwin think about the possibility that you know, these might have evolved and might be different species that are adapting to the specific uh, conditions of their environment. And the mockingbirds are, in terms of their populations, a great example of how some adapt uh, better than others, the Galapagos Mockingbird is on many, many islands. It has the uh, least specific requirements uh, for habitat, whereas the Floriana Mockingbird in the bottom left is so unbelievably rare and so, and can only, it only lives right now on one island, uh, Champion, uh, that it is, there are only about 150 species left in existence, uh, which is unbelievable. To me, I think about the idea of you know, my entire high school class being the entire 
remnant of humanity. And it's just insane to think about such small numbers for a species. And the really scary thing is because it's only on one island, if a natural disaster were to occur on that island, it could be wiped out like that. A tsunami, a fire, that'd be it. Such, a, such an endangered species that has to have so much work done to make sure that it survives. And then of course, there are Darwin's finches, uh, you know, that are the, the poster child of the Galapagos. Uh, as you can see from some of these pictures, these are all different kinds of finches. There are ground finches, cactus finches, vegetation finches, and then there's even a vampire finch and a woodpecker finch. And all these different groups of finches have different size uh, beaks, different shaped beaks, uh, different colors, different habitats they prefer that have helped them radiate throughout the islands and find a specific niche. Uh, the, one of the finches, the vampire finch, actually sucks blood, which I think is so cool. And the woodpecker finch has actually evolved to use tools. Uh, there's one finch, the mangrove finch, which is so rare, there's less than 100 species uh, left in the world. So, you know, one of the benefits of being able to adapt is that you, know, you can fill those niches, but like I just talked about with the mockingbird, the danger is that you're then so specialized that, you know, when some of the, when some of the factors that you require start to disappear or are changed, uh, you know, you're in danger of becoming extinct. So it's a very delicate balance on these islands. And they, you know, Darwin's observations, you can see in real life how the different finches rely on their different food sources and their habitats. Uh, and those beak sizes really do matter in getting food. It's, it's quite amazing to watch, you know, a, a large ground finch uh, crack open a seed, whereas you have that tiny, you can see on the top there, that one on the flower, that tiny vegetation finch, you know, go for the nectar. Whoops, and I'm landing with my, with my very favorite bird from the Galapagos, uh, the waved albatross. Uh, if any of you are familiar with Samuel Taylor Coleridge's Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner, uh, this is the bird that, that, that Coleridge was talking about when a good south wind sprung up behind the albatross did follow. Uh, and here in, on the island of Española, we actually got to see the albatrosses in real life. And I had this great moment where I had a hand shaking, I, I held up my camera and, and I got a picture and I shouted, I shot the albatross, you know, to, uh, to pay homage to, to Coleridge and also celebrate the fact that I'd finally gotten a picture of one of my favorite birds ever. So the waved albatross is an endemic species to the Galapagos. It is only found there, uh, though like all albatrosses, is a pelagic bird. It spends most of its life at sea and only returns to land. Uh, and you can see here, these are the cliffs where the albatrosses were nesting. It only returns to land uh, to mate and to rekindle the bonds with its partner. And albatross relationships, you know, from a romantic perspective are just fabulous. They, you know, despite the, the huge amount of time they spend at sea alone, Every, every uh, breeding season, they will come back to, to land the same spot where they were born and out from all the albatrosses find their mates and they will do this ridiculously goofy dance where they beat clap and they point their heads up at the sky and they talk to each other and they do this beat clapping like this to uh, rekindle their relationship. And so I just think, you know, what a, what a wonderful thing to spend all that time and then go find your exact partner and then have this wonderful goofy dance and then have wonderful chicks, which look like this, another Muppet. All of the Galapagos wildlife uh, seem to make these, or at least the birds seem to make these hilariously fluffy Muppet shaped birds. Uh, so seeing the Galapagos, just the, the, uh, the albatrosses was just this great feeling of, you know, no matter how far I travel or where, how far I go, you know, it's a wonderful thing to think you can go back and then you know, share it all with everyone and, uh, and find, you know, go home. And even these birds can do it. So I'm gonna end here with just a little bit of the artwork I made, celebrate these incredible animals. Uh, you know, th there's really no place like the Galapagos, the color, uh, the uniqueness of the wildlife. And it was an unbelievable experience. And I still can't believe I got to go. And I highly encourage you if you can to go there and experience it for yourself because you know, it's, it's really like nothing else on earth. And, uh, I hope that you uh, enjoy this presentation and uh, I'm more than happy to take questions and uh, answer any, any other comments that we wanna talk about in the time we have left. Oops. So I don't know uh, how, I don't really know how questions uh, would work. I guess if anyone wants to put one in the chat or, or um, Dorothy, Dorothy, I think you're gonna um, coordinate the questions. And we said that, I don't know if I if you have a question, unmute yourself. That's the. Mm -hmm. um, okay, I see a hand um, from A M 
SLR. I'm sorry, I don't know your, all your names, but yeah, Alan Mika doesn't matter. Thank you so much. Uh, I just wanted to ask you how for how long did you go there, and which time of the season did you go of the year? That's a great question. I went. I ended up going on a trip that was 14 days from November 3rd uh, to November 17th, and the okay. season I went in was the cooler season. And from my understanding, from what uh, the guide told me. It's better to go in the cooler season because then you don't have to worry about that rain. Uh, and as long as you go before December, uh, you don't have to worry about the water being too, too cold. I actually screamed a couple of times when I jumped in with the wetsuit. I did think it was cold, but apparently it gets colder still. So November is a good time. And I guess between June and, and November is one of the better times to go. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. It's great. All right. Oh, thank you, Christina. I don't know if I, I'm, I think I'm still muted. I hear, I hear you. Oh, no, we hear you. Okay. Lively and beautiful. I love your photography and the humor and the, all the Muppets. It was great. Yes. Thank you so much. I'm so glad you liked it and that you liked the Muppets. They're so great. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. It was absolutely Thank fantastic. Yeah. Awesome. I Thank you. Yeah, Thank them. you at the a Women's Club for setting it up. I just, I've always loved to read about the Glock. Glock because and what a what a fantastic presentation. Well, thank, thank, you. thank you so much for letting me talk to you all today. This was I miss I miss oh. being able to talk to people. <laughs> so great, you almost feel like I'm there, you know. Oh, it was uh, fabulous. I wanted fabulous. to say I love your enthusiasm. You. Makes oh, yes. I would like to ask um, the the problem of too many tourists is there. A, a time when they uh, limit you uh, in these trips, because I'm, I'm very interested for members of my family, not myself, I think my days <laughs> passed for actually, but I think um, uh, one of my sons, absolutely. This is just such a fantastic thing and the way you've done it is beautiful. So I just wondered what about the restrictions and the worry that tourism is overdoing it and do you, is it harder to plan trips on that basis? And how do you go about that? Well, that's a great question. So the Galapagos have a very, they've set up a very good system of making sure that uh, there are, that their tourism does not overstress uh, the natural environment. So uh, tour companies have to be vetted and then they are all um, on a very specific schedule so that, you know, there's not too many people on each island at a time. And then when it's not one particular tour group's turn to be on the island, you have to be on a boat out in the, you know, on the water off the island. So that at any one time, the island is not uh, being strained by too many people. Okay. Uh, and it's a very, I imagine the logistics of keeping that all planned are very complicated, but uh, there are so many tour options that I think it's definitely possible to uh, quite simply find, um, you know, a, a good tour. And then they, because they have to go through all the logistics, they know, you know, when you can be on the island, when to take you off. And, the, and that way it stays in balance. Uh -huh. Well, before I forget, um, I created this little uh, quick wildlife um, guide that you can all uh, download and uh, keep in case you wanted to, you know, have a little memento of this, uh, which Wonderful. I'm going to drop in the chat. It's from my Google Drive. So as long as this works according to technology, you should be able to click it and then download it and print it and share it with anyone you want, or just, you know, Remember really? some of the facts I spewed out so fast that it's wow. a lot to take in all at once. No, no, okay, no. anyway, before I forgot that. Wonderful. I, I think I downloaded that, the, the little birding for beginners. Is that the thing or? Oh, that's a separate thing. Um, oh, okay. Uh, that's a little field guide for birds that we'll be seeing soon in our area once spring begins. Uh, this is specific to the Galapagos with some pictures and just quick facts that you can impress your friends with. So there was, um, I went into the um, nature, uh, the marshlands in Rye, and all these birders were looking up. And of course, I was like, what is everybody? And I think it was, I couldn't see the bird, but they heard the sound. And it might have been the warbler that you were talking about. Oh. It was this beautiful song. And, uh, and I was like, gosh, I really want to join in on that. But, but I also thought it was funny about... Um, you were talking the the, uh, the volcanic had a uh, Hawaiian names, which I thought was interesting, and then and then I was like the paracord. That's kind of like I've heard dental floss is also good for um, 
stitching things up in a jiffy. So <laughs> I liked your little, um, how you stood up and rip the rip stop uh, your pants. So anyway, thanks, Christina. Um, I also went to school with an Eric ball. I don't know if there's any relation. Oh my God, from a Marinette High School? Yeah. Well, that's my dad. So that's yes. what, Okay, that's what I thought. So wow, I, cool. think, I think we did Jim Dandy together with my kids and you, but and wow. you, you look familiar. So yeah. I, oh, I thought I remember cool. you when you were very little. <laughs> wow, that's fun. We have to tell people that. That's so cool. I don't know if you remember Jim Dandy, but anyway, that was I a remember, long time ago. I remember one of those big colorful cloths that everyone Yeah, the parachute. Yeah. yeah. That's all uh, I nice to nice to see you. Thank you for Me your too. presentation. Oh, you're bring, so more, make, bring more blood to the women's group. We need we need more blood. So <laughs> not, not to mention the vampire, whatever that was. Oh, the, the vampire was thing. Like, oh, yeah, yeah. That'll do it. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. Well, thank you, everyone who attended. I was glad to see Sue Bonadonna, who was our speaker yeah. in September. So happy she could join us also. And everyone who came today it was a great program. Thank you. Sue. It was great. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Thanks, Erica, Erica, for organizing. Thank you so much again. Thank that was you. so fun. Thank you, Dorothy, for, for inviting me and, and having me here. What, what a great time. <laughs> well, good. Thank you well, again. It was wonderful. Thanks, Terrific. Thank you. you can watch thank you. It on TV. It's not, it'll be on YouTube and on TV, so you can tell your friends. Oh, cool. Can you, um, is there a link that, that we can, I, I mean, I'd love to show my family and have that link. Is that, is that going to be a link that you can send out to me? Or? Yeah. <laughs> okay, cool. Great. The link is in the chat box too. Um, if you want to copy it, I just copied your link too that we can send out, but it's one of the first um, chats. Okay. Okay, it will also be, uh, all the members will get the YouTube link as well okay. as uh, LMC TV. Okay. Uh, recorded link. this and they will send it out again and you can request it also at LMC TV. Excellent. Vios uh, channel 36 and uh, Optimum channel 75. Great. But it will be sent out to you. 75. Great. Thank you so much. Optimum 75, Vios 36, and the YouTube link. And what about channel Great 12? Great program. Thank you. Sheila, what? I said, what about channel 12? Regular TV. No. No, I think it is LMC TV. Mm -hmm. and that LMC... is LMC TV. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Oh, this okay. is what they gave I, us. I got you. It's okay. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. Probably Me. they will post it on Facebook as well, I believe. LMC is very good with Facebook. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 And you can print this out already. You just click oh. on it. On Instagram your chat, pages. you can uh, print it out. Wow. Yeah. Very impressive. <laughs> cool. Ah, so much fun. Okay. Very nice. Thank you. Thank you again, Christina. Thank you. Thanks so Thanks much. everybody. Thank, Thank you. you. Have a good weekend. Good to see you all. <laughs> Bye. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <clears throat> Very small. <laughs> okay. Bye.